um, I'm a long habitué of DCU because I've been working with Martin for many years um, doing research mainly on eye tumours. But um, my main job is as a pathologist in St. Vincent's Hospital and the Eye and Ear Hospital. So in the Eye and Ear Hospital, I see a lot of head and neck tumours, um, at least comparatively a lot because they are relatively rare. They're only about 370 new tumours of the head and neck diagnosed every year in Ireland. Um, so I'm a, I got some training, specialist eye training uh, in uh, pathology, eye pathology, uh, paid for by the government before I started, before the recession in the uh, early 90s. So anyway, I just wanted to show you first, I don't know if this is, maybe we might, it might be a bit bright, but not everything, um, not, not every lesion or lump and bump is a malignant tumour. And this is uh, an eye, and I'm going to show you a lot of uh, clinical photographs. And you can see this patient has a redness here, and there's a little uh, lesion here, um, which I hope you can see. And then this is the histology of it. This is the normal uh, epithelium of the conjunctiva. That was the conjunctiva. And there's some degeneration of the uh, tissue underneath this. And this is called a pinguiculum or a pterygium when it affects the cornea. So it's a common uh, thing that people get uh, due to sun exposure. Um, and it, you know, so, so these things are relatively common. Uh, and they're not pre-malignant, they're just benign lesions. And this is another one. Uh, this is a, a reddish uh, lesion on the conjunctiva of the eye. It's uh, raised and um, it's a bit irritated and that's why it's red. And this is a granuloma, which is a collection of benign uh, cells. Uh, it's a circumscribed or rounded collection of cells. Um, and uh, so that's a benign lesion, sarcoid, which can occur anywhere in the body. Um, so generally, if people have lumps and bumps, uh, a biopsy will be taken and it'll be sent to the pathology department. And these are the photographs I'm showing you are of pathology specimens. So what happens with these specimens is that um, a person has a, a lump or bump or lesion uh, and that is uh, biopsied or excised by the surgeon. It's put into a fixative called formalin uh, and it's sent to the pathology laboratory. And then we uh, take it out of the formula and describe it. And then we uh, cut it into various sections to see what the excision margins are like. And then we uh, process it through paraffin wax so that the tissue ends up in a block of wax. And then that wax block is cut into thin slices like as with something like a bacon slicer, very thin slices, floated out on water, picked up onto a glass slide and stained and then the pathologist looks at it down the microscope. So what we're looking at are very uh, thin sections of the tissue that's been sent to the laboratory. So this is just a, uh, these photographs then, um, I'm showing you some clinical photographs and some histology or pathology. What, this is typically what the pathologist looks at down the microscope. This is what I would see when I look down a microscope. Um, this uh, blue and uh, pink t are, the, are the dyes that are used to stain up the tissues. So what a lot of pathology is, is pattern recognition. So um, you have to be good at pattern recognition to be a pathologist. And pathologists are often short-sighted because they like close work looking down the microscope. <laughs> and then we write reports on what we see, which is like a legal report. Um, so you'll have seen uh, when there is misdiagnosis in pathology or radiology, it's where the pathologist or the radiologist didn't recognize the pattern, didn't have enough experience to, for uh, uh, pattern recognition. So anyway, this is, this is a normal eyelid. And just to show you, that's the skin surface. And then underneath the skin surface, there are all these glands here. And they produce secretions, which keep the eyelids and the conjunctiva moist. Uh, and this is just to show you an example of a malignant tumour. This is a gentleman who has a squamous cell carcinoma. You can see this ulcerated uh, lesion here, and then it's uh, reddish or hyperemic around the ulcerated lesion. And this is a scab in the centre uh, here. So um, squamous cell carcinoma is a very common skin cancer. It occurs on the eyelids, the conjunctiva, and all over the skin surface. It's related to sun exposure. It occurs in elderly people and often um, in areas where they have sun exposure, the arms, the face, um, and so on. So um, what happens is that uh, the cells in the skin become gradually more and more abnormal, and that's called dysplastic. Uh, and so eventually all of the cells are abnormal and then they break through a basement membrane. Um, 
and uh, they invade locally or they can uh, travel to lymph nodes um, via the lymphatic system and that's called a metastasis so generally these can be treated locally with um, uh, surgery uh, are the more there are more aggressive variants then so one of the important things for us is that the surgeon sends it to us with some sutures attached to it so that they can tell us which part is um, the superior margin and which part is the inferior margin and so on because particularly on the face uh, you want to get tight margins uh, to the tumour so that the patient doesn't uh, end up with a big scar. So this is just an example of, uh, this is the normal conjunctival thickness uh, and then this is, you can see this is much, much thicker and you can see these cells all look pretty well the same size whereas these ones look pretty abnormal, some of them are very big and there's a big keratin layer on the surface so that's an example of carcinoma in situ, it's, it's, it hasn't invaded into the uh, submucosa but it is it's it's ab the, the full thickness is abnormal so the next stage would be where it broke through this basement membrane and invaded uh, further and that's just at high power to show the variation in the size of the cells how big some of them are compared to the others um, and then that that reddish uh, thing there is keratin which is um, uh, these cells make keratin and they should normally only make it on the surface they shouldn't make it in the middle of the epithelium so this is another example then of a very common tumor um, particularly in, in uh, the elderly who have sun exposure this is a basal cell carcinoma and again you can see this this is the, the you can see it's an older person the skin is is a bit wrinkled and you can see that there is a tumor here uh, you can kind of follow it around and it's ulcerated and there's a scab on the center here's the eyelids so it's quite close to the eye and these are often on the head and neck and um, when patients go to the GP they can find these little lesions and people may have multiple lesions like this but they need to be excised here's another one uh, which has a, a, a sort of a raised rolled edge and a scab in the center uh, and then this is the tumor it looks a bit different to the squamous cell carcinoma in that it's very blue and um, so there, that blue appearance is um, uh, called basal cell carcinoma. So this is a locally infiltrate of carcinoma and it doesn't metastasize, um, so it doesn't go to the lymph nodes. It can be managed locally unless it's neglected. Um, and if it is neglected, it can spread uh, quite extensively. And I do see some specimens from very elderly people who've neglected their condition where uh, not just the eye but the entire orbital contents are removed because of spread of tumour. So there's another tumour then uh, on the surface of the skin around the eyelid called sebaceous carcinoma which is um, an unusual tumour but it arises from the glands which keep the eyes moist, which keep the eyelids and the conjunctiva moist, the sebaceous glands uh, and this um, has an up to 30% mortality rate. So this is obviously a much more aggressive tumor. It's uncommon and it can be misdiagnosed <coughs> because um, people can get around the, um, the eyelids, they can get this sort of crusting or sort of inflammatory lesions and uh, the ophthalmologist can just curette it out and not send the material to histology. And it's maybe not until it has recurred two or three times where it dawns on them that maybe it's not just an inflammatory condition um, so that's called a masquerade when it masquerades as a benign lesion but actually it's a pretty serious malignancy so we always say it's very important that anything removed from a patient should always be sent for histologic for pathology so if any of you ever have anything removed insist that it go to the uh, for pathology to, to, uh, to the department so this is an example of that it often occurs uh, around the eyelashes and you can see that there's some loss of eyelashes here and a sort of you see this scabby appearance which you could just think was dermatitis but you see then here there's this, a raised uh, lesion and it's a bit reddish and maybe a bit undermined there so that's the the tumor um, and uh, as I said they are normal sebaceous uh, uh, glands present and then these the sebaceous material or sebum produces a lot of lipids or oils so we can use special techniques to diagnose uh, that uh, lipid material and that's an example of that this, these sort of bubbly bubbly cells are all the sebaceous lipidy material and that's just a special stain that pathologists use called oil red O which uh, stains up the oil or the sebum in the tumour and that would it helps distinguish it from other 
types of uh, tumour. And this is a, a technique we don't use very often now called electron microscopy, where the cells are looked at at a very, uh, really an intense level where this is one cell and that's the part of the cell, the nucleus, and then these, this is this membrane bound lipid. So that's, you, uni you need a very special uh, sort of technique to do that and it's outdated to a large extent now because we use special stains instead of electron microscopy. So not everything, not all tumours occur in, in adults. This is a little baby with a, a, a very uh, vascular tumour here. Um, and this is a tumour of blood vessels, uh, which occurs uh, in, can occur in babies and it can be removed quite easily. It's not, um, it's not malignant. Uh, and these vascular tumours are, are not uncommon in the orbit. So they cause the eye to protrude. Um, when you see somebody with a very, one very bulging eye, it's uh, maybe because something is behind the eye, that a tumour behind the eye is pushing the eye forward. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is this va benign vascular tumours or malformations that occur in the orbit. And this is an example of one where this is a, somebody, a biopsy of the orbit was taken. And you can see that there's a sort of a, a cystic uh, capsule here. It's encapsulated. And then you can see these spaces here. These are blood-filled spaces. So this is a benign uh, blood vessel tumour, uh, which has been removed. So um, you, you may have heard that there are some uh, uh, conditions which affect various parts of the body which are congenital, and an example would be neurofibromatosis, um, also called von Recklenhausen's disease. And that's where the nerves, where there are benign tumours of nerves that can form all over the body. And those patients often also have sort of coffee-coloured spots on their skin called cafe au lait spots. And it's a condition which is genetic. And um, one of the areas where you can have the nerves uh, becoming enlarged or hyperplastic is around the eye. And you can see here the eyelid margin is distorted. And this is a nerve, a benign nerve tumor, which has spread like a, like a snake almost, or a worm almost ar around the eye here. But it's actually benign. It's just that if people have a lot of them, they can be somewhat disfiguring. And it's difficult for people if they're, you know, teenagers or young adults and, and lots of these things come on. So um, skin tumours, um, I've, I've just talked about tumours that um, occur from the epithelium or the skin. But you're probably hearing more and more about melanoma. Um, and that's some, something that's coming to the fore in Ireland. Uh, the diagnosis of malignant melanoma, which is a, a pigmented skin tumour. Um, and uh, there's a very high incidence of melanoma in Australia from people of Irish extraction because um, Irish people and other Celts and Northern Europeans have a type of skin that's very fair, often associated with red hair. It's called type 2 skin. And we're more susceptible to malignant melanoma. And um, in Australia now, you know, there's a big emphasis on wearing hats that children should wear long sleeved uh, skin protection, long sleeved uh, uh, shirts and so on, because um, we are so um, susceptible to uh, pigmented tumours. So they're not all malignant and the malignant ones may start off as a benign tumour. So a benign tumour of melanocytes or pigmented cells is a nevus. And around the uh, conjunctiva of the eye, you can acquire uh, a melanocytic lesion, primary acquired melanosis. And then um, there are also other types of pigmentation. Uh, for example, some drugs can cause a pigmented appearance of the skin or of the, um, of the conjunctiva when, when, when drugs are locally administered. So you have to make sure that the pigmentation is actually due to a, a melanocytic lesion rather than something else. So um, in the, around the eye, these are raised or flat uh, lesions. They may or may not have cysts or pigment. And it's just the same for the skin. Uh, the skin, um, particularly on the face, you may notice in older people that they may have these irregular patches of pigmentation. And they can become uh, malignant. Um, they're called lentigo maligna. So um, they do rarely develop into melanoma when they're the benign ones. Uh, and, but 20% overall of conjunctival melanomas are associated with pre-existing benign pigmented lesions called nevi. And this is just an example. This is uh, 
a fairly florid example. This is a lady who came into St. Vincent's and she had, you see here, eyelashes. And this is, a, this is, the eyelash was averted and this is all tumour here of the undersurface of the eyelid. And you can see how black it is because of the melanin pigment. So this is all, uh, all tumour. Um, in, in middle-aged people, you can get this acquired pigmentation called acquired melanosis on the eyelid. Uh, and it's important to photograph it, or it's important to photograph any uh, of these uh, pigmented skin lesions. And that's one of the things dermatologists do now. If you go, uh, they'll, they'll photograph the lesion. They'll photograph, say, your back. Uh, they'll photo in fact, they'll photograph your entire body. And then if you come back with a change in a lesion six months later or whatever, they'll be able to compare the photographs and see has it got bigger, more irregular, is it bleeding, um, is it ulcerated, all of which are signs that, it, that the lesion may have changed from benign to malignant. So um, uh, the nest, these are nests of cells in the skin uh, which undergo malignant change, similar to the process in epithelial dysplasia that I showed you. Um, Conjunctival melanomas are the second most common malignancy of the conjunctiva, but overall they're 40 times less common than melanomas arising within the eye itself, and they're uh, associated with prolonged exposure to ultraviolet light. And the clinical indicators of a poor prognosis would be a young age of the patient at first excision, a location within the eyelid, and how thick the tumour is, that would be determined by the pathologist who would measure on the glass slide, how thick the tumour is. Uh, and they have a lower mortality overall than uh, melanomas in the skin, and they have a relatively low metastatic rate or spread to lymph nodes. So that's a piece of conjunctiva which was excised from a patient, and you can see this irregular pigmentation here. It's very difficult to say where it starts and where it ends. So we would slice that entirely through. It'll end up with lots and lots of tissue sections in order to determine uh, how much uh, tumour was there and to measure the thickness of it. And these are the cells. Uh, you can see this pigment here within the cells um, telling you that it's a melanocytic uh, lesion. And this is an example of, just to show some <coughs> clinical photographs of a pigmented lesion on the conjunctiva. There's maybe a satellite lesion as well. And you can see these large, thick blood vessels associated with the lesion. They're called sentinel blood vessels. This one is very irregular, and you can see it's thicker in parts uh, than in other parts, so it's quite difficult to get around that lesion. And then this is the histology. These are these large melanocytic cells, and they go up here, percolating right through up to the surface. Um, but the important thing is how far down it spreads. So this is the end of the skin here, and this is this tumor uh, beneath the skin and just again showing the degree of pigmentation. Uh, and uh, this is what's called a mitotic figure where the cell is in division. So we count the number of cells that are in division as well to give some indicator of how aggressive the tumor is. Um, it, they can be treated locally with a cold therapy, with a, a cold knife cryotherapy, and then that causes some scarring. Uh, and then there's a recurrence here after the, the local treatment. Um, so just in relation there to um, two melanomas um, on the conjunctiva, they can be treated locally for quite some time uh, and can continue on for years, but then eventually the eye may need to be removed and the orbit accentuated. Um, there's no really good treatment for melanoma. You'll have heard perhaps about, um, there was a lot of talk about IPI, which is a drug used uh, in some skin melanomas. It's, it's no use in uh, ocular melanomas. And even for patients, um, you know, it just increases your survival by a relatively short amount of time. It's not really a permanent cure. There is really no cure for uh, an aggressive malignant melanoma. No chemotherapy will cure it. And um, so it's a very deadly type of tumor. It's far worse than you know, a carcinoma, like we hear an awful lot about breast cancer. Breast cancer now is becoming a curable a disease. Uh, the long-term survival is very good, but melanoma is a pretty deadly cancer to, um, to get. And it's uh, something which, you know, in some ways there needs to be a lot more public information about it because people still don't realize that you should be wearing so much 
uh, protection and you should be wearing hats and you should be wearing sunglasses and all that kind of thing. You know, I think the message is, is getting through, but it's still on the rise in Ireland. The number of melanomas <laughs> is on the rise. So, <clears throat> so that's a pretty deadly tumour. One which is not so deadly is a, a, a tumour of uh, lymphoid tissue. Uh, and you, you've probably heard of li the lymph nodes and they contain lymphocytes. So those lymphocytes can spread around the body. And this is a, a patient who has a, a reddish tumour here and here. And on biopsy, this turned out to be a tumour of lymphocytes. This is a much larger tumour here involving much of the uh, conjunctival surface. Um, and then these cells are all lymphocytes, so there's just a huge proliferation of them. But they can be treated very readily with chemotherapy, and it's a tumour which can be controlled um, to a large extent. And then we use special stains to type those lymphocytes up into various subcategories, and the treatment is determined then on the subcategories. You can see they, they all look much the same because they all come from the same cell, so it's a clonal proliferation. And uh, that was just an example of a tumour called a malt lymphoma because it affects the mucosal tissue. The M is for mucosal and conjunctiva is a mucosal surface. Um, so then just to um, uh, just talk about a few intraocular tumours. So that's tumours that occur within the eye itself. Um, and melanoma is the big uh, tumour which arises within the eye in adults. Um, in children, there is a tumour which occurs in lit uh, kids under the age of three years old called retinoblastoma, and there is excellent treatment for that. So once it's diagnosed, um, that is a very, very good curate. And Professor Michael O'Keefe in Temple Street provides an absolutely wonderful service to children from all over Ireland. Uh, he's the main man for retinoblastoma. He's had fantastic results. And he's just such a great guy that GPs can ring him up from anywhere and say they have a child who has a white re a reflex in their eye and he'll see them very quickly. Um, so in adults, the other tumour you get is a metastasis, which means it's a tumour from some other site in the body, like the lung or the breast, that has spread to the eye. So it didn't arise primarily in the eye, but it, uh, it spread from, from its original site. And there's a few rarities. So uveal melanoma, or melanoma of the inside of the eye, is the commonest primary intraocular tumour of adult life. Um, we see about uh, between 30 and 40 uveal melanomas, new ones, every year in the eye and ear. Um, at least I do. So that means they're tumours that were so big that the eye was removed, the eye was enucleated, or take, the eye in total was taken out. Um, the surgeon would see more um, because he would see smaller ones that he's able to manage by uh, using uh, heat or light, laser or cryotherapy uh, to the eye and following them up then. So it arises from the uh, pigmented part of the eye, which is behind the retina. And um, most of them are, arise from the back of the eye, but there are some from the front of the eye, from the iris or the ciliary body, which is just behind the iris. They're almost always uh, unilateral, and they initially grow as a pigmented or a non-pigmented plaque-like lesion. So there's quite a big surface behind the eye, and the tumour may be there for some time before the patient actually has some symptoms. So what people complain of is they complain of a, a curtain coming down, or their vision being distorted, or floaters, or something like that. Or it may even be picked up um, when people are going in for glasses. So this is an example of an eye this is an eye which has been taken out and nucleated. So that's the front of the eye, the conjunctival surface. And this eye has been cut in two like an egg, so um, split across. So that's the, the front of the eye. And this is the back of the eye here. And here's this tumor within the eye, a pigmented tumor, a malignant melanoma within the eye. And, and they're not always black. This is, the, this is another tumor which is white, but it also is a melanoma. So that's the front of the eye. That's the iris, that's the lens. Um, and then this, this me membrane-like thing here is the retina, and that's where, where you know, the light strikes the back, back of the eye, going through the lens onto the retina. And then, uh, obviously, the retina then is pushed uh, forward by this tumour, so it detaches from its normal uh, place of adhesion. So that's why the patient then would have come to, to uh, attention, because 
half of their visual field would be gone. So they can arise uh, on their own or they can arise in a pre-existing benign uh, pigmented lesion. They're usually slow growing. They can be present for years. Their prognosis is relatively good, but um, recurrent ones can give rise to high grade tumors. That would be, you know, obviously if the eye is removed, it can't recur. But um, if they've been treated locally uh, and they recur, they may become high grade. And they can spread diffusely on the iris surface and uh, around the uh, chamber angle. That's where the the normal vitreous or the normal fluid within the eye escapes into the bloodstream. So this is a histology. That's the front of the eye, the, the, the conjunctiva and the cornea, which is in the center. And this is the iris. Behind that, you can see your own iris, <laughs> obviously. And the ciliary body here. And the, this is the tumor here, which is spread on the surface of the iris and right into uh, the angle here. So um, that could cause the cornea to adhese, adhere to the uh, uh, iris and uh, cause quite a lot of pain for the patient and also raise their uh, intraocular blood pressure giving them glaucoma and these are these melanoma cells again containing pigment large pink cells um, and just showing here this uh, filling up the chamber angle within the eye so a ciliary body is just behind the uh, iris and that off the, the tumor often presents with visual disturbance or it can present as an iris tumor where you can see it on the front of the eye because it's spread into the iris. And the histology is, is the same in all of these, the appearance under the microscope. They can, the choroidal ones or the ones at the back of the eye can present in a variety of ways. Um, this again is showing you another one of these tumors which has really grown very large uh, and pressed up against the lens and causing adhesion of the uh, cornea and the iris. This one has detached. You can see this detachment of the re this cellophane-like membrane, uh, the, re the retina. And this one has uh, really uh, become necrotic. Or this one would have caused symptoms suggestive of infection because all the tissue has uh, died. And this one has spread behind the eye. So that would have pushed the eye forward, giving you this bulging appearance. And then this is a huge tumor. Uh, so this is the eye has been removed, but so have all the contents of the orbit. This is the orbital fat and this huge tumor behind the eye. And again, an example of an exenteration. There are the eyelids, and the eye has just completely been replaced by this black tumor. So, um, you know, not all... It, 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 melanoma is a very mysterious disease. About 50% of them metastasize and, and the patient dies. Uh, within six months after a metastasis. But not all metastasize, and we don't really know why some of them are so aggressive and some are not, and that's part of the focus of the research that's being done here to try and understand that. But what we do know is what's important in determining an individual person's prognosis is the size of the tumor and whether it's spread outside the eye. So if it's very large and it's spread outside the eye, they're more likely to have a metastasis. And they're just some blood vessels on the surface of the eye which are completely replaced by tumor. So that tumor has left the eye and it's on the way to the liver. Uh, again, very large uh, tumor which is ulcerated forward and spread outside the eye. So that would have a very poor prognosis. Uh, and then there are various features that pathologists look for, including how aggressively the tumor is dividing, whether there seems to be a, uh, a response, an immune response to it, and the type of cells that you see. Um, and we have a categorization for those based on how spindly they are, or how large, uh, are, uh, and the patterns, that's ca called a, a fascicular pattern, sort of looks like bundles, um, or whether they're very large epithelioid cells, and they, they're, they're associated with the worst prognosis, or whether the cells have died completely. So um, the spindle cells have a better prognosis than the epithelioid of a worse prognosis again showing um, mitotic activity, um, which is of prognostic uh, studies. I'll go through this fairly fast because I'm sure you're getting tired now at the end of this. Um, that's just showing deposition of DNA, uh, uh, an immune response, um, which isn't really prognostic. And then there's some chromosomal abnormalities which can be associated with prognosis. And we always study those. We send those for chromosomal studies. And chromosome 8, chromosome 6, and chromosome 1 are all uh, important in melanoma. 
So it's really unclear whether they're directly involved in the tumor or what, what it exactly means. We just know that if they have these mutations, they're associated with the worst prognosis. Um, then they can be treated in various ways uh, with uh, proton beam, which is done in the UK, local resection, uh, or various local uh, methods of treatment. Um, I just skip through those because of time and just move on to retino, finish up with retinoblastoma, which is the common eye tumor in childhood. Um, it's still relatively rare. There would be maybe four or five cases a year. Um, and uh, it's a tumor from, that arises in the retina, uh, which can be, grow into the vitreous cavity or into the subretinal space. And this is an eye which has been enucleated from a child who had a retinoblastoma. Um, and you can see the entire eye is filled with tumor uh, here. Another example, this is the retina which is detached and this large tumor. And the histology showing this uh, bluish tumor here, this is the normal retina which is detached and the tumor here at the back of the eye, that's the optic nerve, the lens, the, the cornea. Uh, this tumor is very extensive. This was uh, not an Irish child. Um, where the tumor actually ulcerated out through the surface of the eye. And again, uh, that's the histology of that, showing it's all tumor. So it's, it, the tumor arises from the retina. It's very rapidly growing, and um, it re recapitulates the appearance of the, uh, of the retina. Um, that's the normal retina here, which is a very highly organized structure. And then this, this is the tumor within the retina. Um, and these are dead cells, um, and then that's viable cells. So these cells died because the tumor outgrew its blood supply, and that's just another example of the, the, the dead cells. So um, these tumors are, are very, uh, once they're diagnosed, they can be treated very effectively. And the reason that one eye is enucleated is because uh, in those uh, um, patients, the, there's a, a, a mutation in the cells uh, which is in every cell in the body, but when they get a second mutation, it just affects the retina. And <coughs> if, the fir if the largest tumor is removed, the second one can be treated very effectively with chemotherapy. Um, so, sorry. so these are just showing you, it's just recapitulated the appearance of the, of the normal retina here. And here again, they, these look like um, photoreceptor cells within the retina. And they invade then into the uh, underneath tissue, the choroid, and the, into the optic nerve. They typically grow down the optic nerve. So untreated, they're fatal, but with treatment um, that should be greater than 90% uh, survival. They can be hereditary or sporadic, and they're associated with a, a gene called the uh, retinoblastoma susceptibility gene. So because that mutation is carried in every cell in the body, the survivors are at risk for other tumors, uh, including uh, bone tumors and muscle tumors. But it is a triumph of, of chemotherapy. So I think I'll leave it at that. That's a lot of information. Probably didn't realize there were so many tumors within the eye um, and um, such a variety of cell types. So I'd be glad to take any questions if anyone wants to ask anything. <laughs> Too much, probably. <laughs> any idea of why, you know, it's a big question, any idea why retroblastoma responds so well to therapy and melanoma really not at all? Well, I think one reason is that um, the retinoblastoma cell turns over very, very quickly. And so when you look at it, there's a, there are a huge number of cells that are in division. And um, tumors that are divide very rapidly um, are treated effectively with chemotherapy. So surprisingly enough, if you have a high-grade breast cancer, you can get rid of it if the treatment is effective. Whereas if you have a low-grade breast cancer or a low-grade lymphoma, you may, you'll never get rid of it. You can bring it under control, but it can recur. So I think that retinoblastoma is really a highly dividing tumor, and I think that's why the chemo is so effective. And would melanoma be rapidly dividing? No, no. I mean, for example, um, 
a melanoma, when we look down the, patholo the field of view that the pathologist sees, there might be no or one mitosis or less than one in 40 high power fields. Whereas with retinoblastoma, there's tremendous um, number of mitosis. No. Well, well, the only thing is um, uh, ocular disease, yes, not melanoma, really. Um, but um, Irish people and Scandinavians can get a type of glaucoma um, that's called exfoliation glaucoma, where a material that people don't really understand is laid down on the back of the lens and it gets it gets into the channels or uh, little sieve like channels that the um, that take away the, the normal aqueous fluid. So those people are, they become blocked up, those, those little channels, and people get what's called exfoliation glaucoma. And that's certainly associated with a blue eye color and with a certain sort of uh, type of um, immune expressor, HLA system that uh, people have from Northern European ancestry. <laughs> but I think people with, br with brown uh, irises are, possibly just as likely to get melanoma. Um, but people who are black do not have as high an incidence of melanoma, which is surprising in some way because you can understand in the skin because they have better pigmentation, but it's also true for ocular melanoma. Yeah, that's right, yeah. They spread locally. No, they don't metastasize. They spread locally, but they can be very aggressive locally and they can spread, um, you know, that's why you may need, if they're not treated, they, they may need to have quite an extensive operation. But no, they don't spread um, to the lymph nodes. No, no. If, uh, yeah, yeah. it's the squamous cell carcinomas that spread to the lymph nodes and, the, um, and elsewhere. doesn't seem to, no. Do you think that's a different biology or that the yeah. ones are diagnosed later? I think it's probably a different biology because one of the things we look for in skin uh, melanomas is that um, whether they have a lymphoid or an immune response and it's an immune therapy. So um, we, we comment on the degree of lymphocytic infiltration or immune response in skin melanomas, but if you look at eye melanomas, they don't have any lymphocytes really. They don't seem to have an immune response. And it's also an immune privileged site because it's within the eye. So it's not subject to the same degree of immune exposure as the skin. But all those new melanoma treatments are, they're, they're really only for a very, very limited number of people. I mean, uh, there's one of them that's uh, what's called a BRAF inhibitor. It's a, a, a biologic treatment. And you have to have a certain type of um, gene status for that BRAF inhibitor to be any good. And it, it's ineffective in most people. Um, about seven years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it manifested as a, a large uh, B cell diagnosed yes. Behind my right eye, so I had to receive uh, radiotherapy yeah. and chemo. And um, I, I'd be interested to know of the likelihood of it man if uh, I'm in remission, obviously. Yeah. But uh, if it can't, if something comes back again, is it likely to come back in the same spot or somewhere else? Well, somewhere f else. well, first of all, if it was a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, that's. Um, you can be completely cured by chemotherapy. The low grade ones are, you know, are, are difficult to eradicate completely. Um, but the high grade ones, if they respond, they generally don't come back. But if you've had um, a type of tumor, it, it depends really on, the, on the, the exact type of B cells. But um, if it does come back and it's a, an extra, a malt lymphoma, it's likely to come back at another um, mucosal site it is more likely to. So it could come back in the other eye, or it could come back in around the lung, or the stomach, or cutaneous skin. But um, they're very treatable, you know, and so if they do come back, they can be treated again 
uh, if it's the low grade one you know they can what they say is with those that you live you don't die of them mm -hmm. you die with them yeah. that they're just you know then they may not cause you any problems.